Greetings to you all in the name of Jesus, and welcome to Bible in a Year, Day 60. We have reached a new level. We're now in the 60s. Go ahead and congratulate yourself. Congrat yourself. <laughs> Con congratulate yourself. <laughs> congrat yourself. Uh, you know what? I'm going to run with that one. Praise God. <laughs> Go ahead and congrat yourself on reaching day 60 if you are just joining the Bible series. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> we call things that are not as though they are. So I'm in the book. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen, if you're just joining this uh, video series, Bible in a Year, I just want to welcome you and encourage you to travel the rest of the scripture with us for the remainder of the year. Uh, don't worry so much about going back to day one and trying to catch up. That's a little bit of a burden there, and I don't want anyone to get frustrated by the amount of reading that is there to do. But if you have the mind and you absolutely have the will and determination to do so, by all means, I encourage you to get wealthy in the Word and just continue with us. This is going to bless you. We need to know what the Word of God says. We need to know what the Bible says. We need to know what the Bible teaches. I believe that all the answers that we need, everything that God wants us to have is found in the Bible. And God speaks through His Word. His Word is powerful. It is the very thing that Jesus used to overcome the enemy. And we all have an enemy that does not want us to possess the promise and fulfill our call walking in our destiny. So let's get into the Word. Let's hide it in our hearts and let's give God the glory. We are in the book of Proverbs again, I believe. Praise God. Yes, we are in the book of Proverbs. And there's a couple of scriptures in this passage that I want to highlight. And, you know, in light of all of the things that we see going on in our world, um, a, the abortion thing. I keep seeing things on my news feed concerning that, and it's just heartbreaking. You have some states that are vouching for, yes, uh, we will allow termination of the baby after the baby is born. I mean, it's a baby. Like, I don't understand the logic other than, you know, these people are either mentally retarded or they are blind, willingly ignorant, dumb on purpose, stupid, foolish. I could think of a whole lot of other adjectives that would probably get people to question my Christianity. So I shall relieve, relieve them unspoken in the name of Jesus. But here are some things to pray for. This right here, these passages, they reveal the mind of God. And if you know the mind of God, then you can pray according to His will. So, in regards to praying for our nation, praying for our cities, praying for our country, our state, praying for our neighborhoods, praying for the people in the world that we live in, here are some things that can be used as guidelines. We can bring ourselves into alignment with the mind of God, praying his will to be done on earth, and we should see the power of God moving because God answers prayer. When we pray, especially when we are praying something that God has already voiced his mind on, there is already understanding how God feels about it, and we choose to come into alignment with what he said, and with what God thinks, and we begin to pray His will, the power of God will manifest in a mighty way to work out His will on earth as it is in heaven. God is King in heaven. 
everything that he wants is done. His servants, the angels, they serve him. We are representatives, ambassadors of heaven on earth. God works through the agency of man whom he has partnered with, namely those that believe on his name, those that belong to him. And God will use us to bring about his will, to establish his rule, his uh, authority on the earth. That is why our role as ambassadors and representatives of the kingdom of God is so important because without the agency of man, God has restricted himself from doing anything on the earth. He is always looking for a willing vessel. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that every single person is called to preach. It doesn't mean that every single person is called to teach. It doesn't mean that every single person is called to quote unquote evangelize. It doesn't mean that. We all, as members of the body, have our specific place, a God ordained place, and we have been gifted and fitted to function in the place wherein we've been called to. There's no better place to be than in the will of God. If God has called me to be a teacher then, and, and I am not called to be a prophet, then I don't want to operate in the office of a prophet because I have not been fitted or designed to do so. If God called me to vacuum the carpet at my church, and he's given me a desire and a passion for it, then I should not try to pastor the church. Everyone has a distinct call of God for their life and what God expects of them in this portion of life. Yes, in this portion, in this life. I emphasize the difference because life on earth isn't our final destination as believers. This, this isn't, life wasn't meant for here, right now. We're not living for the here and now. We're living for eternity. We're living for the time that is yet to come. This is just something that we're passing through. A momentary habitat, if you will. So the scripture reads as follows in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. I am reading from the King James Version of the Bible. You, however, may feel free to follow along with whatever version you are comfortable with. Or listen to me dictate to you in the Old English. Verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yeah, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, some of you immediately thought about the government, <laughs> and hands that shed innocent blood, abortion, and other means of unjust murder, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Somebody that has wicked thoughts and imaginations that thinks about wicked, evil things and then goes and tries to make those inventions happen. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. My, I suffered from that. Boy, I quickly got involved in some mischief and nonsense in the name of I'm living in the moment thug life and that stupid lie that I bought. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Wow. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. This is what God hates. This is an abomination to God. God hates this. He did tests these things and loathes them. They are a stink into his nostrils that, ugh. Yeah, it, it's ugh to God. And there are humans out here that walk in this as if it were their calling. And a lot of these we see in our leadership, government, places of authority, that's why we need to pray for our leaders. 
not talk trash behind them, behind their back about them, not slander their name. Who are we to do that? God didn't call us to do that. He gave us eyes to see and ears to hear to pray so that we can be watchmen. Remember, we are ambassadors of heaven. We are linked up and connected to the kingdom of heaven here on earth. The angels work for us to bring about the will of the Father. And we are supposed to be an agency that, that works with God, that works with the kingdom, propagating kingdom agendas because God has a plan. And that is what we want to see manifesting in the earth, no matter what it is. God has a plan. That's what we want to see. Life should be simple. And then there's flesh to complicate things. Let us, I pray, slide into the New Testament, where we shall examine a couple of verses in the 10th chapter of the book of Mark. Beginning with verse 32 and 33 and 34. And they were in the way, they were in the way. You ever had somebody just in your way? You're trying to get somewhere, you're trying to make moves, do things, and somebody's just in the way. Well, I don't think that this is what they're talking about here. So let's continue reading. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. And again, here we have Jesus explaining, listen, this is about to go down. He taught them several chapters ago. We talked about it in a few videos. And here we are again. He's explaining to them what is about to happen. I mean, how many times has he told them, listen, this is about to happen? He says, saying, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the son of man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And for some reason they didn't get it. They, they didn't get it. Because right afterwards, as if this just totally went over their head. James and John ask him, hey, listen, Lord, um, we want you to give us the desires of our heart. If we ask you, Jesus is like, what do you want from me? What do you want? And they said, listen, man, you know, we want to sit at your left and right hand when you're sitting in your kingdom. Yo, what? Jesus just told them, listen, they're about to kill me. They're about to torture me. I'm going to die, but be raised again. And they're saying, listen, when you get to where you're going, we want to sit next to you and rule with you. <laughs> wow. Whew. Yeah. Like, hey, how human of us. And the others, when they found out, they were not very happy. I mean, imagine Peter. It's always been Peter, James, and John that went with Jesus and they got to experience these intimate moments with the Christ, with the Savior. And all of a sudden, James and John decide, listen, <laughs> let's ask if we can sit at his left hand and right hand. Well, where does that leave Peter? This is just me speculating, thinking about the scripture, tossing around a few thoughts, having fun. I imagine that, you know, Peter was a little sour with him. Like, yo, I mean, like, you're just going to leave me behind? Like, I mean, I thought we were people's. Yeah, not so, Peter. Jesus assures them like, hey, it's not my place to give away to you. And um, we, we want the best, don't we? <laughs> I do. I don't know about you. God, I want you to give me the best. I want you to supply me with the coolest things. I want to be your favorite. I want to be close to you. Jesus answered and said, okay. He said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from? Without even thinking, they're like, yeah, Lord, we can drink that. Wow. I wonder what John thought 
while he watched Jesus die on the cross? Did he remember the conversation, are you able to drink? Wow, that's a heavy thought. Are you able to drink of the cup that the Lord has prepared for you? What if that cup called you to go in the places that you don't want to go? What if that cup calls you to do things that your flesh doesn't want to do? We must be prepared because we don't know what the future holds. Unless God, of course, has revealed it to you and told you, hey, this is what's going to go down like he did Peter's and you're going to die. Peter, <laughs> this is how. Yeah. But you know what? Like I said, this life is not the final destination. So, however, the Lord wants us to glorify him in life or be it death, if he wishes. Then let us do so. Let's slide down to verse number 47 and 48. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, this is blind Bartimaeus as the Bible identifies him. And it makes you think like, oh, it's just, it's blind Bartimaeus. Like we're supposed to know who that is. Like, oh, let's, it's blind Bartimaeus. Everybody knows blind Bartimaeus. And that's how it kind of comes off to me. I don't know about you. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. They said, hey, shut up. You're making a lot of noise, see? And we don't like that around here. Quit that, all that commotion. But he cried the more with a great deal. He, all, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. This is what the blind man is crying out. But he's probably heard of Jesus, that Jesus was his hope to see. And now he hears this Jesus coming down the highway where he's sitting. Wouldn't you get up and try to get the master's attention? Wouldn't you do everything that you can to get your miracle? The Bible says he lifted up his voice to try to get his attention. Have you tried to get the attention of Jesus lately? Or have you given up after calling once? Lord, I need your help. Help me. No answer, and then it must not be thy will. You walk away. Now, what happened to crying out to God until he turns himself about, so to say, or until he gives us his attention? Hey, what do you need? I think that this postmodern world has placed within us this inability to wait on God and linger for the Lord, to press and persevere. It seems to me that we have this microwave mentality where I want a meal that takes six hours to cook in four minutes and 38 seconds on high, 1200 watts. That's the mentality that we have. Right now, right away, our way. And God just doesn't function like that. What happened to getting into prayer and with the mind to get a hold of God and I'm not gonna stop until I do. I'm putting the phone down, I'm going on airplane mode. Ooh, preach boy, preach boy. What happened? What happened? What would happen if we put our phone on airplane mode for a couple of hours and just got lost in worship? 
What if we took our needs to God and put our phone on airplane mode, turned the TV off, threw the remote somewhere, and just got on our knees in the living room and worshiped and got a hold of God until he responded? What would happen after the first hour if nothing happens? Where would that leave you? Would you be offended? Would you feel sad? Would you feel sorry for yourself? Well, God didn't hear me. God's not going to answer. Or do you got some wind in you? You got some get up and go. Do you have some press in you to push? That's an acronym for pray until something happens. Can you push? Can you push your way into victory? Can you push your way into a miracle? Can you push your way into the attention of God Almighty? Or have we allowed our flesh to get us short-winded? Maybe our situation isn't as dire as we proclaim it to be. And our actions certainly don't validate or back that up. Perhaps we've gotten comfortable and used to living in our bondage, living with our sin, and we've just acclimated our daily routine, daily routine to the travesty of being in bondage, coming short of the glory. Wow. Why not push? Why not press? I tried to think of a <laughs> an acronym for press real quick, but nothing came. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Anyways, anywho, blind Bartimaeus spoke to Jesus in faith. He called him thou son of David. He identified him as the Messiah. You are the son of David, the prophesied Christ who was to come. You are he and I need you. That's what he was saying. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus called him, the Bible says that he left his garment. He had on a beggar's garment, a garment that identified him as a handicap, impotent folk. In faith, he cast his garment, believing God's about to get a hold of me. Some of us need to drop some things in faith, release some things in faith and move towards Jesus. Let it go. Leave it. Leave it in faith and walk towards God and see if he won't meet you to bring your status to where it needs to be, to where your faith is. In the name of Jesus. We are in the book of Leviticus, Levi Ticus. I don't know why I think it's funny to say Levi Ticus or Livy Ticus. <laughs> it's pronounced Leviticus or so I've been told, and, but I'm not quite average, so I'm going to say Levi Ticus or Leviticus. Levy Ticus. <laughs> Let's go there. Let's go to Levy Ticus, chapter 6, verse 13. Hmm. Let's see what the Lord says. Chapter 6, verse 13. The fire shall ever be burning. Ho! Oh! To receive that real quick. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. Oh, God. The altar, the altar, it shall never go out. God commanded, saying, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Is the altar of your heart on fire? Are you burning right now with passion and fervor and zeal? Is your heart, is the altar of your heart on fire? 
Don't let the fire go out. God is saying, let it burn. Don't let the fire die. Don't let your love die. Don't let your passion die. Don't let your zeal die. Don't let your patience die. Don't let your long suffering die. Don't let your faithfulness die. Don't let the fire die. But let it ever be burning upon the altar of your heart. What can I do that the fire of my heart remains ablaze? How can I make sure that the fire that's on my heart will never go out? There are some things that you can do. One of them is abide in the flame that fuels the fire of your heart. And that is Christ Jesus. He said in John chapter 15, and I do not quote, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit on its own. We have to abide in him in prayer, through meditation, Bible reading. We must keep our minds stayed on God. We got to keep our thought life flowing in the Holy Ghost. Stay in the fire to be on fire. That means when the fiery trial comes to try you with fire. And Peter said this, he said, he said, count it, think it not. No, that's not Peter, that's James. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing is happening to you. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Let that fire form you. Burn away everything that needs to go, but stay in the fire. When you feel the fires of temptation, the fires of your trial, stay in the fire. That's how you stay on fire. Don't give in, don't quit, don't walk away. Abide in the flame. Let it fuel the fire of your heart and the passions of your heart. Overcome in Jesus' name. Don't give in, don't put the fire out because it's burning some things. You see, a lot of times we want fire and then God sets our soul on fire and we feel the burn and the zeal and the fervor and the passion and we want to pray and we want to preach and we want to read the Bible and then trials come and temptations come and all of a sudden we don't want to pray anymore. We don't want to preach anymore. We don't want to be in the word no more. Our mind, our soul is so distracted with the feelings that we feel that are completely opposite to what the reality of God is. And then we give in. We don't pray. We don't, we don't speak the word of God. We're not in the Bible. And we're taking away fuel from the fire that fuels our passion and our zeal. Just because it gets hard to read the Bible, just because it gets hard to pray, doesn't mean that we messed up. It doesn't mean that we don't got it anymore. It doesn't mean that we've been rejected by God. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is that we got to push. We got to press. We got to persevere. We must abide in him. He said, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Has your fire gone out? Has your zeal and your passion gone out and you've allowed yourself to dwindle and drift into this comatose state of carnal mindedness to where you're bouncing back and forth from the flesh and you're not walking in the spirit where you used to pray and seek God. Now you're indulging in carnal things. 
things of the world. Be careful that the fire on the altar of your heart shall never go out. If you feel a spirit dealing with you right now, and something in you that yearns to repent. I feel like I need to repent. I feel like I need to just, just ask God forgive me. I feel like I need to turn back to that. Then go ahead and do so. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, turn our hearts completely and totally to you. Help us to abide in you. That the fire Never go out, but let it be ever burning on the altars of our hearts that we lift up to you. We know that flesh must die so that spirit can live. Give us grace, O oh God, in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the grace of God be with you and his peace ever console you.